Welcome back to the Levity Zone with Dr. Bruce. In our previous podcast, we opened the second Ojai Salon with the sharing of a vision of a sane, sustainable, and healthy world of the year 2050. Now, return to that intimate evening in a stone room in Ojai, California in June of 2013 and dive into dialogue, theories, and stories shared by our audience. already present with me. It's not, too, it's not uh, 2050. Um, I'm 73 years old, and depending how the issue is framed relative to time, it doesn't have to be that far on into the future. It can be right now. But I feel that it has to be approached individually. Hmm. One individual can do it right now. In fact, there probably are individuals who are living this vision right now, but they're not, they're not known to us. That's not to take away from the need for planning and for uh, visioning out into the future. And I'm fully in favor of that. We need planning, but over planning itself is problematic. What my uh, particular take on this is to live it right now. Mm -hmm. Live it totally as I can. And uh, I have a project also, if you don't mind. Sure, yeah, I'd love to hear about it. giving a plug for it. Uh, In fact, I'll be filming tomorrow in a garden setting, in a greenhouse, in a garden, in the river bottom. And it's part of my project that uh, I'm going public with it. So I'm uh, impressed with what you're presenting here and and anybody that this message can get out to. My project involves a vision like that, but my project is radical as far as the solutions that I'm offering. In other words, what I often feel is that the elites are really following the mass of the people. We tend to blame the elites but that isn't going to solve the problem. It, there are things that I will I, I identify in my project after my the theorizing, the painting of the big picture, uh, the drawing together of disparate elements that need to go into the big picture. And then that theory or that visioning needs to have a very radical practical application. And that's where I see the lack of that. Mm. That it, our actions that all of us people, masses of people, are doing that are supporting the elites. We're doing it unknowingly. We're being tricked into it. We don't know what we're doing. And if we can identify those things, this will give the solidity to the theory that's being presented. And this will be the solution to the problems that are pretty well analyzed. But the solution, in my mind, has not yet been identified at all. It's still flying under the radar. But it's so radical that it's going to be very unpopular. Mm -hmm. So my vision is that it may only take five people, a handful of people that get the radical part of it and apply it to their own lives that may turn it around. That's what I feel, that 
it's not quantity, it's quality. It may only be one or two or three. But, uh, so thank you. Uh, I didn't mean to sidetrack this in any way or, or no detract from it, but I want to fully support it. But also, I play off of it. Can you give us a hint about what you're, you're starting your filming tomorrow? And yes, well, I, I don't know if it's, if it's uh, proper to plug what, actually what I'm doing to give it your airtime. Totally, totally curious. <laughs> yeah, curious. Yeah. Okay, so the project is called thelovegovernment.com. That's the website. The website is just being built, and I've, done a, um, uh, I've already done about 50 episodes It'll be going up on YouTube mm. and on the, on the website, the lovegovernment.com website. When I'm done in about probably a month, two weeks, a month, there will be uh, 52 uh, 15 minute episodes up on YouTube. Plus, that's one track. The other track will have maybe 20 episodes. And then there's the written thing, the website itself. So the project, it's a game. It's a story, it's a journey, it is a structure, and it is a relationship. It's all based on love, in the impersonal sense. And the main figure of it all, in the personal sense, is what the love government calls the lover, Hmm. who is a uh, symbol, a sign of the times. Right at the beginning, you spoke of our origination story as a species. That, to me, is what uh, the love government is based on. It goes back to our originating event or appearance. And those stories that supported that, and without that uh, reenactment of those Hmm. originating activities, we will not succeed, because unless we're faithful to our origin, our originating uh, plan. Mm. And unless we understand what destroyed that plan, Mm. almost for the most part, 99%, we live in an anti-love culture today. Mm -hmm. Something destroyed that, and it's still operating. So I don't want to take up too much of your time here, but... Oh, no, this is beautiful. That gives you a a taste, so... I don't want to overpower because... I guess I should say this before I conclude. The, the, the main problem, or the main enemy, I don't want to use the word enemy, but it's, I don't, can't think of any right now, is which the feminists have brought up is patriarchy. Patriarchy is, a, is the word that identifies the problem. Unless we take that seriously, and unless we take the vast literature that has been developed mainly by feminists and take it seriously... We will never solve our problems. We're always going to be going, uh, spinning our wheels. And until, we, until you identify the enemy, and, and you know your enemy, inside and out, uh, we will not be successful. Very few people are willing to go into the dark side, identify the enemy, and go up against that enemy directly. You know, directly. Thank you, by the way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thank you. Dennis. Thank you. The thing that I see is, I look at those people on Capitol Hill, all those congressmen and senators, I'm so glad there are more women, but a lot of the women are part of the system and they're, you know, they can't do much. <laughs> but I see them and I, I just, they just, something about them, they, I already look at them and see them as the past. I don't see mm-hmm. them, I, for a long time, there's something about them that's just, I don't know, it's, they're not even the same as the kind of urban people. There's just something yeah, about in, their energy. They're in a bubble, in a cultural bubble that changes them as soon as they get into it. And, and the way they look, what they eat, yeah. the whole thing they're affected by. And and so I see this contrast between them and some of the good people. And I feel as if the only thing that's going to resolve this is that them dying off. Because the thing that will save it are, are the people like Ed Snowden and kids that are in their... 18, 20, that mm-hmm. age group, that's what's going to save it because they don't want any part of all of this. They think this is ridiculous. What Larry Lessig was working on, um, you know, and he's probably the smartest person in the world, especially about how you change the system in the U.S., and has written several books about uh-huh. it. And his, basically, he said, look, 
if you get 38 state legislatures that vote for a constitutional convention, you can hold one. It almost happened, in, I think, in the late 19th century. They almost had enough states. You know, my concept, I call it a radical remake of America. You have citizen groups that come together. There's no professional politicians. In fact, the first, the first act of the convention is to relieve all of the politicians of their jobs because they were put in there by a system that's not considered legitimate. Oh. And the second vote is the, the, the umbilical cord of money between powerful forces and the political and lawmaking system is cut. So lobbying becomes an, an illegal activity and all those offices on K Street or E Street or wherever close. So the convention has done those first two things and the government can run just fine without any sitting politicians, federally, just fine. Now, there's another view of that, of your idea, that I'm familiar with. I've heard, do you know who Tom Hartman is? But he's written some profound books about what you're talking about. He would just love listening. This is what he's talking about. And um, as he said, the problem with the Constitution of Convention is you get too many opinions and you have to compromise. Hmm. And so the bad people come in with the good ones. And so you're, what you're doing is sort of opening everything up to take the whole thing apart. Mm -hmm. And so I guess his approach was a constitutional amendment rather than a convention because a convention kind of makes it open heyday on the Constitution. But you know, it's what Larry writes, which is so beautiful. He says, when I get ordinary citizens in the room, it doesn't matter what persuasion of politics and religion and ideology they are, there's a warmth to the interaction. There's no intermediaries. And I find the members of the Southern Tea Party that come and meet with my friends from California and New York, they get along. It's a yeah, miracle of miracles. They get along because they're not part of a structure of power and a structure of influence and prejudice. And there's no media there. There's no sitting politicians there. It's just people around a table having a meal. And he said, the power of that that connection can remake the society. But there is a certain group of people that are disqualified from being there because their behaviors in the past have led to the crisis you're now trying to solve. They're, they're not invited to the table. So that's, that's Larry's approach. Oh, that's beautiful. Isn't that, that beautiful? Sense, yeah. It's right. ordinary people. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and you find that. I, I, I was talking to a friend uh, who he and his wife they visited, I don't know, something like eight countries. They were in Russia, they were in Asia, they were all over. And he just said, it's it just people the same all over. That it's they're the all, same. you know, so many good people, really good people everywhere. And it's just our buddy governments, you know. And truthfully, and this is something, a talk I gave a couple of years ago, that probably in the United States there are no more than 500 individuals that are causing most of the damage in business, in politics, in religion. You could probably identify 500 influencers that, um, and their roles, they're not individual people, they're niches. They're like ecological niches. Mm -hmm. Because if X corporation, like for instance, Exxon or BP gets in trouble for the oil spill, mm -hmm. well, CEO's heads roll and they're gone. But that niche is still there, and there's going to be a future CEO of BP, and there's going to be future behaviors that lead to irresponsibility and problems. Mm -hmm. It's the niche. So you actually have to not attack individual people, but attack structures. And it's almost like a, a meta battle. The enemy, if you will, that you're fighting is a kind of a ghost samurai. It is the shadow. And you're not fighting an individual, because as soon as you're fighting an individual, you get the foibles of fighting an individual person. You know, you're saying we're fighting this overall behavior or these the relationship of money to politics. It's not any individuals within that. That's how Larry can get agreement from mm -hmm. the left and the right. It's like, yeah, you know, a right wing Republican congressman from Louisiana hates this money system because he has spent so much of time away from his family raising money. He says, I know it's not good in my gut. I know it's wrong. And whereas a liberal congressman from Minnesota hates the system too. So what Larry does is, is the samurai is fighting this thing that has emerged. 
no one's at fault, but we need to deal with it now. And you could identify those shadow warriors everywhere. You know, what causes X? What causes our hunger for petroleum that leads to all the destruction? Do you, well, you know Jessica Sinich, right? You know, yeah. I heard him speak at the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation in Santa Barbara mm -hmm. in February, and it was just magnificent. And um, one of the things he said is that you know, we were talking about violence and wars, and as he said, as long as we have wars, we're going to have violence here at home with guns. And, mm -hmm. But, it, you know, he's, he's aware, too, that this is change that we have to make as human beings. It's not about Washington. And in fact, there's Steven Pinker, who's a great philosopher, thinker. He actually has come out with a book that shows that we are living in one of the least violent periods of human history. Can you believe that? That if you roll back the clock a hundred years, five hundred years, five thousand years. The, the, the Aries, Aries age. Well, any it? age, because in a traditional town in the Levant, in Mesopotamia, a third of the population met violent ends. A third. Not just from early childhood disease or something. It was at least that, sometimes 50%. And so we are actually living in a time of a vastly decreased violence. We, we see it, I mean, we get news of it, but on a, on a daily life basis, we are safer and more peaceable now than we've been in the history of since the plains of Africa. You know, because the, the horrible news about the plains of Africa period was there were many hominid lines in parallel, and the reason why we're really afraid of horror show films of people with slightly distorted faces that scare us is because for several million years we were getting our brains bashed in by hominid lines that looked a little different than us. Uh -huh. we were, it was a continuous war. It wasn't the Garden of Eden in that period, the time of the drying savanna. I know, it's easy to forget. It's easy to forget. Genetics have found that there was a single mother to all of human beings because we have this one gene shows that a single female birthed the whole of the human race. And what that means is that, that there was a very, very small group mm -hmm. somewhere with one female that had the mutation. And for some reason, her offspring, they went on and they, they populated the entire human race. In, in other animal groups, this is not the case. In groups of rabbits, you see all these genes all over the map that showed there was you know, initiating lines all over the place is quite diverse, but human beings is one. We came from one mother. Mm -hmm. and, and that perhaps goes back to what you're saying, Dennis. It does. What they found, though, and this may provide you grist for your mill, in South Africa, they've been starting to find these old human uh, settlements with basic tools, but when you look at the ash on, in the fires, it's really old. And in that period, Africa was, the climate was fairly severe. And they found a cave on the South African coast that had a human habitation in it. They were living on shellfish. You know, that's a good protein source. And this branch of human seems to have been a potential candidate for the humans that then exploded and radiated back out in north into the East Africa. And then about 300,000 years ago started moving into Europe and the Middle East, which you can see if you get your DNA tested now, you can see the, the tracks of your ancestors. Right. It's really fascinating. So it could be, and this is sort of in, a, in our fantasy, that was the sole surviving group of modern humans driven to the very tip of Africa, surviving on shellfish, very, very small community. And there'd been decimation of habitats to the north, and there'd also been this interstitial war going on. And that was where the original Ur mother is from. And that that colony made it, this what's called a genetic neck. And from her came the radiation of modern peoples mm. and back north. You know, something that I find fascinating that relates to what you're saying is that um, I couldn't figure out why in the last eight months or this last year, there's been a barrage of discoveries of tremendous ancient civilizations. Mm. And I found out that 
there's because of some technology, technology maybe it's lasers or certain technologies have made it um, possible to excavate or to reach some of these yeah. these things. And and what I was thinking of when you're speaking of it might be interesting for you to look at some of them. How is it that we've been around and we never knew about all these things and they're all of a sudden surfacing? And I think it's it's messages from the past to help us. That's what I think. Yeah. And so the, the one that I'm really fascinated about is the discovery of a city, a lost city in the Mediterranean Sea. Yeah, there's... there's the, You've heard about that. Yeah, um, the Turkish coast. This is such an amazing thing. I was in Istanbul on the... I, travel to Pakistan pretty frequently and I come back through Istanbul. Do you really? Yeah. Coming back through Turkey, one of these trips I'm going to go to this excavation cuz you can go there. And until this excavation, Kal Shatal Hayak, archaeologists believed things happened in the following order. Uh, we invented agriculture, therefore we had to centralize all our food stores and protect them from marauding other peoples and therefore we invented granaries and we had specialized people and we created cities. Well, it's not the case. The first large city, and they think it was a city of 5,000 souls that's being excavated, was hunter-gatherers grouping together before agriculture. So Chateau Hayak was a Neolithic city where people had built with bricks all these packed houses and they would come and go down smoke holes with ladders down into their place which was like a cave and they had cave art on it and they would burn their fires and they buried their ancestors underneath the floor and then they would climb out of the holes and they would go down and there were things like streets but there were no temples there was no government no temples no administration it was a collection of hunter-gatherer peoples so casting our minds back to the way we were Oh, I know. helps us to figure out how we can so go back, how we can so recover ourselves. Because you can imagine in, in ancient cities like that, with no temple, and didn't seem like there was a standing army, there was no kind of big buildings. You need to have big buildings to have central government and control. If there are no big buildings, it's a communal place. It's truly a communal sharing place. So you can imagine the culture that was shared, the way people lived, and this is pre-language. I mean, people have spoken language with no literate. There was no written language. There was no accounting done. There was no legal codes. So what was life like in these places? Can you date that again? I think that this particular place is about 8,000 years ago. Huh. It's a great pride of the nation of Turkey, and they're, they're really being careful in the excavation. And so here's the question the plan. So who co-opted the plan maybe between Shat al-Hayuk and the rise of Mesopotamia which had temples and had central government and had a military system? What happened in between that hunter-gatherer world of dependency on nature, dependency on the seasons and, and this coming together of the people with mutual support? What came into the system? And it could be, you know, I call it the manic monkey that in comes the monkey that is the psychopath, that discovers that they have this mesmeric power over other monkeys. Why? Because they have charisma and they have this uh, ability to affect other groups in, in, in a way that delights them. I mean, it's control. It, it, it's control and, and then this feeling comes in. and. So in the middle of one of these proto-cities rises this crazy monkey, mostly it's males, that tries this game and figures out that they can get a whole bunch of the other of our ancestors to do their bidding. And then it all starts. Is that where it started? That, is that where the plan got hijacked? You know, and if that's the case, so the rise of the kingdoms of Egypt, the Indus and Mesopotamia, and you see these incredible patriarchal structures just explode onto the scene. The whole of the modern world exploded onto the scene, you know, five, six thousand years ago out of nowhere. What was the driving force? When we had lived as hunter-gatherers for millions of years, and we're not talking tens of thousands, millions of years. And also, isn't that 
I mean, when you see lions and animals, how they eat other animals to survive, isn't that just the balance part of the, unfortunately, to have that kind of energy along but, with... But no other species But can. that was around the time when the brain size jumped radically, like there was no it, it, other... It actually wasn't. The modern human was well in place by Chapel Hayek. Here's the funny thing, though. So we are like basically modern humans. Around that time, we have full language, we have full culture, and then this thing creeps in, but we're totally modern, modern humans. No other species cannibalizes its own. No other species has the scale of usury and abuse and warfare that we do. Our ancestor, our branch, the chimpanzee, you know, at Gombe in Africa, Jane Goodall discovered, to the horror of primate researchers, that chimps have wars. Uh, bonobos, which are the other part of the equatorial region, of which we are branched off too, don't have wars. They resolve things through care, mutual grooming, and copulation. The chimp, which branched off after us, has, has conflict and war. Mm -hmm. So we talked about this in the first Ojai Salon. It's somewhere in there. So we have this in us. We, we have this manicness in us. There's a charismatic, crazy, you know, the power center that gets hit. And, and that... Yeah. Well, the fear, we give in to fear of those with power, and then that feeds, it's a codependent. But code the people with power are in fear, and that's why they're that way they are. Good point, good point. And, and what Dennis was saying in that lecture, as I say, if you go to um, wagingpeace.org, and you scroll down, it's right on there. But as he said, which is a good way of saying it, is that we've gone from being an authentic society to being a sociopathic society, which is what you're saying. Mm -hmm. But so what you're referring to now is that really, truly authentic society. I have a question, Dennis, for you, if you don't mind, because it, as you pointed out, the problems have been well analyzed mm -hmm. and well documented in that I think I heard you say that I don't think you use the word solutions, but perhaps you would see it that way, and that they're going to be unpopular. Very unpopular. Um, what is it about the solution or this remedy to this well-documented problem that exists that we're speaking about here that, in your view, would have such an unpopular reaction. Well, it goes because it, it will go against the grain of our culture. Yes, exactly. Totally against the grain. It, it, it will, it will uh, uh, challenge so many taboos, so many habits, so many uh, belief systems that it will it will be difficult. For the people sitting in this room? Do you think mm -hmm. it will be difficult even? It's going to be difficult for all of us to accept, uh, well, I would like to qualify this by saying that this is a theory I have, and uh, you brought up some information that I would like to talk to you about. I need to pick your brain, because uh, I have also read some of these books you're referring to, and um, it's important that we identify the problem as much as science, science will allow us. And then we also need to, to also use other sources of information besides science. but. Mm -hmm. One area that I would, if I had, if you would, if we could get into a conversation or, or is to uh, zero in on the most recent scientific studies regarding what uh, I have referred to as mitochondrial Eve or African Eve, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you refer to that as a common mother. In order to apply the solutions, uh, it needs to be uh, solid. It can't be uh, uh, too theoretical. And it has to be multi-sourced, but one of the big sources is the present state of scientific knowledge regarding our ancestors, our origins. Uh, in my mind, our species, our, the full flowering of our species, appeared in, in, in terms of developmental time very suddenly and very strangely. We appeared among mm -hmm. all of these other animals and hominid lines and so on. And uh, you brought up some new information I'd like to get more clear, but from the, what, what I read uh, is that this appearance took place about 100,000 to, to 300,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. And the gene studies seem to support that common mother 
about that time period, she appeared. There's a controversy over whether it was one single individual or it was a group, a small group action, but uh, that, had, that, that we appeared as a species at that time with very, very striking characteristics that were new on the scene. And it's not just our physical characteristics, such as, uh, uh, you know, no fur, women having bare faces, and, and, and especially the sexual uh, newness of the woman's way of doing sex. It was brand new, very different. Hmm. And, that's, and, and, and uh, as you said, if a person from that time period, say, say let's say 100,000 years ago, appeared on our streets today, uh, dressed as we are, we would not be able to tell the difference. They're that much, that's, mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the information I get. That's what we were talking about the other night. Yeah, so. that there seems to be in, information that suggests that the changes that have occurred since that time have not been genetic changes. We were talking about this the other night. The changes that have occurred have been of a different order. As you say, the physical appearance of this being 100,000 years ago, if that being walked into this room right now, the they, would, they wouldn't strike us as appearing different. Um, and so the changes that have occurred in us since that time are not of a genetic character, no. but they're of a different they were, type of they, character. I, I feel they were a characterological. We did certain actions, in my theory, that changed our characters and it had to do uh, with the killing of animals. Mm. Mm. This, I believe, this, my theory is that, that our, when our species appeared, we were very different. We did not kill animals. We were not hunters. We lived on shellfish, as one example, mm. Mm -hmm. and we lived on insects. We were, uh, I call it, Eden vegan, healthy vegan. Mm. It was a diet. So the dietary component was important. Now, when we began to kill animals, uh, these were the, the proto-patriarchs that did that. You mentioned the, uh, mm. the, the, the mad monkey. Mm -hmm. These were actually uh, patriarchal, proto-patriarchal men who were jealous of the power of women. The subtle weaving of this, the first of several audience conversations to come, may well help us wend our way toward that wondrous world of 2050. The exchange between Dennis, Sarah, and Jeff, with some suggestive storytelling by me, Dr. Bruce, may slowly be opening a realization to the transformation that we and our world all so desperately seek. Musician Steve Murtaugh provided the melodic thematic bookends to this podcast and backing compositions for the second Ojai Salon series. Cover art by Jacob Amon using a photo of Dr. Bruce by Jeffrey Harris. Join the conversation yourself through our Contribute section at www.drbruce.org or through our new easy-to-remember domain www.levityzone.com. And feel free to reach me, Dr. Bruce, directly by email at bruce at damer.com. Yeah.